Good afternoon, people. How are you? It's wonderful to be here. You know, it's really an honor to be part of the, the festival that celebrates humanity. And I'm also very happy to uh, see that education is playing a role in this, um, this uh, festival. I came from Helsinki, Finland yesterday, so if you don't understand everything I say, it's because of my jet lag. <laughs> or my language. I can speak Finnish to you also, if that's easier. <laughs> um, let me tell you what I plan to do, and there will be some time for, for your comments and questions in the end. In the first half of my, my talk, I will tell you some fiction and some facts about Finland. And in the second half of my talk, I'll show you how Finland is similar or different to the, what the rest of the world is doing in education. And in, in the third half of my talk, <laughs> I'll speak a little bit about the lessons from Finland, what, what are the things that other people have been looking at and taking away from Finland, and I'm happy to share those things with you. Did I understand correctly that there are only two people who have been in Finland in, in this hall? The other one is Olavi, who is sitting here, who is a Finn. Any other Finns here? One, okay. Are there any Swedish people in the hall? Another one, okay. <laughs> Very good. Now, let, let's begin with a question that I normally ask in, uh, before the audience, like, like this, and it's simply asking you to try to capture the idea that passes your, crosses your mind when you think about Finland. So what is, what is the first thing that is uh, in your mind when you, when you look at this magic word, Finland? What's that? Kaurismäki. Small country. What, what else? Alcohol and snow and ice. <laughs> in that order. Nobody says ice hockey. <laughs> Herring, very funny. <laughs> but, but you know, when I, when I ask this question around the world, what most people see is exactly this, nothing. Because people normally don't know anything about what, what Finland is like. Or then there are these things like herring and vodka and ice and snow and, and darkness. This is probably the most common image that people, most people have uh, really around the world when they think about what the Finland, how, how does it look like? Uh, so many people, most people see ice and snow and darkness. There are many people who think that Finland looks always like this. There is 12 months a year and 24 hours a day. Uh, the country is always like this. Then there are those who say that that's why Finnish kids are so smart, because there's nothing else to do but go to school. <laughs> and when you've done in the school, you come back home and do whole evening home, homework, because you cannot go and play baseball or ice, uh, football uh, outside, because it's uh, cold and uh, icy over there. But those who have been in Finland, of course, know that it's not, not always like this. This is the other image, one of my favorite images, that tells <laughs> another story about Finland. Um, Somebody here probably said the forests and lakes, you know, this is the, the most country, uh, our country is filled with the, the lakes, the water and, and, and forests. But there's something else in this picture. Is there anybody here who has a good friend who is Finnish? Not finished, but Finnish. One, two, three. Okay, now you have one more because I'm with you. <laughs> okay, but if I ask you a question that, tell me something about your Finnish friend. What, what is a kind of a typical thing that would characterize your Finnish friend. Many people say that, you know, these Finnish people don't talk too much. That they only speak when there's something, something very important to say. And I lived five years in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, but I'm fine now. <laughs> and, and one of the most difficult things for me was to learn this small talk, you know, that when you talk with people that you, you, you folks are very good at, that you can, you can talk to another person without having anything to say for hours. <laughs> And that's something that we simply don't do. That we, we speak only when it's very uh, absolutely necessary to say something. And there's, there are many stories about Finns, uh, this, this side of uh, Finnish people. One of my favorite ones is this, that there was a couple who had been married for 25 years or more, and one day the, the wife said that, you know, now, now it's enough, I'm going to ask this question from my husband. And this went over the breakfast, and she said that, can I ask you something? Why, why don't you ever speak to me, talk to me like I see the American and French and British men talk to their wives, saying things like, I love you? And this Finnish man didn't quite understand what was behind this question, so she say, he said that, do you remember our wedding day? 
Of course I remember our wedding day, she said. So you also remember that on our wedding day I told you that I love you. <laughs> and she said, he said, that, of course I remember this. And then the Finnish man said that if I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> but you know, if you take all these, uh, all these uh, images that people have about Finland as a country or the people or the culture, where people don't talk too much and it's always ice and cold outside, how can they have an education system that is always in the headlines whenever people compare your education system or others uh, to the best of the world? So let me, let me show you some, some things that are more true than these uh, that you saw here. The first one is that pe people often think that maybe Finland has been successful in its education because they have had a kind of a strategy and plan to be the best in the world some way. And if the country is relatively wealthy and it's always cold and dark outside and it's small and rather homogeneous, maybe it's been easier to be better than anybody else. But this is not true. Uh, if you look at the world now, what the ministers and uh, education leaders are doing around the world, including this country, they often set their goals by saying that we want to be the best country in the world by 2020 or 2025, as measured in these international uh, student assessments. Okay? This is the most common way of setting the, the national education reforms and education policies. But we, we have never in Finland thought like this. Actually, for us, it's enough if we are better than Sweden. <laughs> but any, anything else goes. This is much more how the Finnish way of thinking about education uh, system and developing education has looked like now since the 1970s. So throughout the, the last four decades, we have, our aim has been to build a school system that is good for everybody, that provides a good school for every child in, in the country. And these two ways of thinking about education are very different. They lead to very different types of uh, actions and implementations and the school particularly schools and teachers experience these two different policies in a different way the finnish way that you see here on the left hand side is probably leading to the issues asking that does every child has the support that they need in the school are the teachers well prepared to work uh, towards this goal and so on whereas the other one this uh, this other policy other way of thinking leads to higher standards and more data and stronger accountability that you have seen here and in many other countries around the world. Then the other one is about equity and people often say that but you cannot compare Finland and the, the United States that is so great and diverse and huge um, to one another and of course we can't because we are so different. But it's not only about the size and diversity and, and the people and the cultures that are making us different. One of the big differences that we have is related to how we think about equality or inequality as, as well. So I'll show you something that you may find different, uh, interesting. I have combined two things here. So I, what I'm looking at here is the, the inequality in the countries in terms of how the national wealth in different countries in the world has been divided among the people, right? So when you move... Um, on the right-hand side here, this means that inequality increases, so the countries become more uh, unequal, okay? So there's a bigger gap between the, those who have and those who have not. And there is more equal, e equalities here. And then we look at the student achievement or, or student learning there as well. Higher the country is over there, the, the better the students learn math and science and reading normally, okay? And this is where the, the average of these two variables is. And now my question to you is that where, where do you think the United States is as a whole? United States as a country, as a nation? Where? Somewhere here? Okay. Lower? You are over there. Okay. So one thing that you, you, everybody knows here is that the United States is one of the most unequal nations in, in, among the wealthy uh, developed countries. Okay. And your, your learning, level of learning in the international uh, studies is a, just a little bit below the, the international average, okay? So that's where roughly the United States is. And let me show you where Finland is. And, and look at this, how different we are in terms of both achievement, the learning outcomes, and also the, 
uh, equality or, or inequality over there. And this is where Canada is, and here you can see uh, about 20 plus wealthiest nations in the world. So you will see that the, um, the correlation is negative, meaning that when the inequality increases, when the gap between the, the rich and the poor gets bigger in the countries, also the, the educational performance of the nation seems to go down. Okay? But the main point here is that Finland, together with Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, the Scandinavian countries, are some of the most equal countries in the world. This is a very important thing for education, at least in our part of the world. And then the third one is that Finland is also seems to be a very successful state that people often don't think about when they are asking the question of education, why education system is per performing so well. So I'll show you something that you can easily, anybody can find out in the, uh, in the internet nowadays. You can just uh, type uh, global indexes or international comparisons of, and all these things will come and more. And here, I'm not going to go through all these things. You can, uh, you can see that if you look at the economy or technology or innovation, Finland seems to be performing compared to the United States very, fairly, very well. But then there are things like political empowerment of women. And look at where the, the United States is among the, all the countries in the world. So if you have 17 or 18 percent of women sitting in your House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., or you have, eight, I think, 18 or 19 female senators, it's very difficult to get these child-friendly um, um, uh, and, and health-oriented education policies um, and, and laws ever passed anywhere. So next time when you go to vote, consider giving your vote to a woman because women can make a big difference in this country as well. We have, in, in our parliament, we have 48% women, and in our government, it's a 50-50 balance between female ministers and males, and that's, very, that's been a very important part of the, the whole story of Finland for a long time uh, now already. You also see that Finns are some of the happiest people in the world, which I don't understand always why. How can it be? <laughs> okay, and you know, in the middle of all this media hype, <laughs> One of your newspapers concluded like this, that if you, if you really want to live the American dream, you have to move to Finland. Um, we still have some spaces for those who want to come. And I, I also want to uh, tell everybody here who is uh, concerned about the high tuition, in, increasing tuition fees for higher education, that we are offering free higher education for everybody, including American young people, if you want to come there. So <laughs> that's considered as a basic human right. Okay, now let's move to the second part, and I, I would like to show you how, uh, actually ask the question that how, how does education uh, thinking look like in Finland if we compare it to the, the rest of the world, okay? Are we just doing same things that you are doing, trying to do here in Chicago or the United States or in England or Australia, New Zealand or France or Germany, but because we are smaller and wealthy and all these other characteristics that we are just more successful with these things, or is Finland really walking its own way in education, that it looks very different? And, and I'll let you to decide how this looks like. I'm using here a term, global educational reform movement that I've been working, this is part of my research uh, that I've been working now for the last 15 years. And if you take the first letters of this, uh, this term, global educational reform movement, you get this interesting acronym, GERM, because I really think that the, the education uh, ideas in education behave very much like virus in an in epidemic, that they travel around the world and infect people first, and then people infect the systems and schools, and uh, then everybody's sick and nothing works. Okay, uh, but this is not a theory. You know, when I was um, when I was a very enthusiastic young student, I went to teacher education in Finland. That was my first job. I was teaching math and science. I had two theories: how to raise children but I didn't have any children that time. Now I have two sons and no theories anymore. <laughs> and this is how it works in ed ed education. But if you look at these things, these are all very familiar to you, and I'm not going to go into the details of these things because you can, you can use your own imagination. But just take a couple of these things. That One of, one of the most common things I see around the world, really within this movement of global, uh, uh, this global movement, 
is the increasing faith in competition. The idea that education systems, whether it's a local or district system or the national system, can be, should be run like we run our businesses or corporations. In other words, more competition through choice and uh, other means will somehow elevate the quality and lower the cost. This is a very common way of thinking many parts of the United States here, that the competition is, is, is going to solve the problems of the lower achievement and particularly closing the achievement gap here. But there are some other things there too. Uh, standardization by setting standards that are higher and uh, similar to, to all, and um, uh, accountability that is based on test. That's why I call it a test-based accountability. Um, and then, you know, speaking about education as an industry. I came from the Middle East on Thursday, and there it's a common term to talk about education, not as a service anymore or human right, but it's something that is an industry. It's a business. Education industry is a term that is used now because it's very much moving more and more to, towards private uh, or public-private partnerships or private education in many parts of the world. Very soon we're going to see first public education systems that are completely privatized. They're not public schools anymore. Just everything is run through public education. And it's going to be a very different, uh, different picture. If you ask me that how does it look like, how the, um, um, the germ-infected classroom looks like, this is a picture that I often use here. If you look at these students, the pupils there, that a, represents a very, very typical Finnish elementary classroom nowadays, or high school uh, classroom. And this, been a, this has been a common thing here in the United States and many parts of the world for a long time. So we have very different uh, children there, very different pupils. They have their different intentions and abilities and uh, motivations and many other things. But if the system is saying that everybody has to do the same thing because of the fairness or some other things, what this system is doing is not teaching or helping these kids to learn science or math, but many, many of, of those will, what they will learn in the school is that they cannot do these things, that they are stupid. I'm not good in math. This is what many kids around the world are now learning, or that they're learning that I cannot learn science because I'm failing there. And I, I think it was Einstein who said it very nicely that if we are judging the ability of a fish, one of the students there, by asking him or her to climb the tree, what happens is that this poor fish will live all uh, his or her life knowing and thinking that he, he is stupid, okay? And this is what we should not do, and this is a kind of a, a very common thing within this uh, germ-infected uh, systems. So this is how it looks like, and this map represents a kind of an idea of, you know, what has happened. It all started in 1988 in England with the, uh, the Education Reform Act, moved to the United States and a little bit of Canada, and then went to Australia, New Zealand, and boom, then the rest of the world. So you can see that these germ infections are uh, all over the base place right now. In other words, there are systems that are relying on competition, standardization, standardized testing, accountability, choice, thinking about education as an in industry, really in all the continents right now. This map looks pretty much like the map that we saw for the first time in, 19, in the summer of 1983. Do you remember what happened then? Eight. HIV and AIDS became known, right? And germ is a little bit like HIV and AIDS. It's killing people in the end. You know, there are, within these systems, there are many, uh, many parts of the world where children are taking their own lives because they cannot take this uh, increased pressure and higher expectations anymore. But even more than that, there are, there are increasing um, number of incidences where children are killing their parents because they are pushing them too hard, particularly in South Korea and the Southeast East Asia. And this is only because of this virus called germ. So we have to take this uh, more, probably more seriously than we, we have uh, considered. So if you ask me that, so where's the evidence? Okay, fair enough that there is such a thing going on, but what do we know about the competition, standardization, accountability, choice, all these things that are part of this germ within different education systems. I'll show you some evidence that is uh, actually quite interesting. And this comes from the OECD uh, so-called PISA study that is probably the best known international student assessment at the time. And what I'm showing you here is, first of all, there are different countries here that I argue have had an infection um, in the 1980s and 1990s and afterwards, okay? And these countries are United States here, England, Canada, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, 
Netherlands, and Sweden. Okay? There may be some more, but these, these are the good examples of the germ-infected countries. Some of them have had a more serious infection. Some of these countries are recovering a little bit, getting a little bit healthier, but some of the countries are remaining infected and feeling very, uh, very weak and, and bad indeed. So we are looking at the 15-year-old students, children's math performance in these different countries, okay? And what you see here is this is the results in the 2000. This is 2003, 2006, and 2009. So we are looking at the uh, four consecutive OECD PISA studies in these different countries. And what ev everybody can see there is, first of all, that there's no country that has been able to improve their math performance. And it's the same thing with science and reading. It doesn't, the pattern doesn't, doesn't really change at all, okay? In many of these countries, the decline has been uh, kind of a consistent. So things have got worse and worse and worse year after year. And that's, of course, something that no minister or politician were, was promising. Those who were advocating competition and standardization and testing were saying that these are the things that will fix our school system. But you will see there that none of these school systems have been able to do this. And this is where Finland is. And I'll show you soon that Finland has remained free from most of these, or all of these things that I have been mentioning here by choosing a very different way in its education policy and education reform. And you will see here that Finland is one of those very few countries with the increasing, uh, improving uh, performance in mathematics. The last one, the 2009, had a little bit, little dip, uh, but still the trend has been in, uh, improving, okay? So what has Finland done? How, how, the, how the Finnish policies and reforms compare to those, of, those elements of the germ? And there are many other things that you can see here, but I'll just show you these five things. The first one um, is that we have, rather than relied on competition, we have tried to keep our classrooms and schools free from unhealthy competition. And I think it's a responsibility of policymakers to make sure that there's no harmful elements in a school system that will enable schools to compete or students to compete or teachers to compete against one another. One of those things that we have done systematically throughout the, the history of education actually is that we have not engaged in collecting the data from the schools or from the students or teachers that would lead to comparing them to one another and create a competition. So the, the whole issue of what type of data Finland is collecting about the education system is a very different thing. We, we think like this, that we, our task at the, in, in the government and in, at the level of the system is to protect children and teachers from un, uh, unhealthy and harmful data and competition, okay? So that's one of those things. Another example here is that we, for example, in Finnish schools, it's against the law to create students before the fifth grade in the primary school. So the, our children are not receiving any grades, ABCs or numbers uh, until they are in a fifth or sixth grade in, in, in a primary school. And simply because we don't want this, these numbers or grades lead to competition between students or competition between teachers when they compare this or competition between families. How common it is that you have a dinner at home and you compare your children's grades and then suddenly the dinner tastes much better when you see that your kids are doing much better than your friends or neighbors, children. So we are not doing anything like this. We don't believe in standardization. We actually standardize only two things. One is the school financing. So we, we have a very strict standards to fund our schools so that the, the schools that need more money and more resources will get more. And the other one is teacher preparation. Here in the United States, you have 1,700 different teacher education programs. We have only one, just like Singapore. We have eight universities that provide this one program, but it's a very carefully standardized so that every single teacher must get a similar type of education regardless where they study. And that's why we, we rely more on personalization or creativity, actually, is, is another word for this, that we try to personalize and individualize our teaching and learning much more than you do here in the United States or many other parts of the world. I often say that Finnish education system, Finnish school system is the most individualized school system in the world because by law we have to design teaching and learning in a school according to the needs of every child. When you standardize, you are not doing this because you, through standardizing you are trying to educate everybody to be similar. This is one of the ideas of the common core standards here in the United States, that everybody should learn 
similar things in the same way, assessed in the same, using the same instruments, and we are not thinking like this. Then we uh, do not have any standardized testing in Finland until the end of the high school, but we try to build trust and responsibility in the schools. Accountability and responsibility are two, two different things. I often say that accountability is what is left when responsibility is taken away. And they are two different things. Accountability is not the educational term. It's uh, coming from the market world and corporations. It appeared in education somewhere in, in 19, uh, 1980s. Now that's why the trust and responsibility are the ones that Finland is trying to do. We don't really, we have a school choice, so parents can choose the school in, uh, for the children in Finland, but we are not driving the improvement and reforms by uh, encouraging more choice uh, for parents. But we have cho chosen the equity that is more related to making a good school for every child, insisting that every school in every community in any, any uh, part of Finland must be a good school. And then we don't see education as an industry, we see education as a, as a basic human right for everybody. And that's why all education is free in Finland. It's against the law to run a private school or private university that is leading to decrease our qualifications and ask money for that. And it includes, as I said, it includes your children also. If you want to send somebody to do a, a first degree or PhD in Finnish universities, you can study in English and you can do it for free still. So that's why I think this, it fits very well to this uh, theme of this festival, that it's a human, it's a basic uh, human right. So let me come to the, the, the last part of my uh, my thing here. How, how are you doing? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Is there, is there a teacher here who is considering leaving his or her job? <laughs> Anybody? I have one copy for you. Can you come and collect this? Yeah, you. And now when I give you this book, don't leave. Yeah? You read this book and you stay in your job. <laughs> don't go. We need you. You know that in the United States, in this country, half of your teachers are gone, they leave their jobs before the end of the fifth year, okay? And that's one of the biggest problems that you have in this system because you will never have a kind of a system where you have experienced educators like most other education systems uh, have. But you know, the, the title of my presentation was the miracle, the miracle of, the Finnish miracle, but my message to you is actually that there are no miracles, there are no secrets. It's a very common sense way of thinking about how to build a system of education. I think here in the United States and many other parts of the world, you are too much focusing on individual school, how to build a good school, make a great school. And anybody can do that. Give me the money and the students and teachers, and I can give you a great school. But it's a completely different thing to build a system where you have the children and you have the parents and you have the families and you have the buildings and resources and make this system work. And that's where we have to uh, pay more attention to in different parts of the world, okay? So my fa favorite topic here is equity. And if you take anything away from this presentation, it's this. That if, if there is something that Finland has done particularly well, is, it is that we have been working for the last 40 years to enhance equity within the system, uh, our education system. And by equity, I mean here something that relates the children's family background and their educational performance together, okay? So if you have more equitable education system, it means that the, the family background of, of a child and the educational performance in a school do not have a strong correlation. They, there's always a correlation, but it's not so strong, okay? But if you have more unequitable edu education system, it means that the, by looking at where the children come from, you can basically say how well they are doing in the school. And here in the United States, you know that if you take the high segregation and high poverty areas away from your, your map, your schools are performing almost like in Finland, okay? So it's an equity issue here in the United States, much more than it would be a quality issue. And that's something that people have to think again in, in the countries like uh, this one and England uh, and many other places. So what I'm showing you here is the, the equity is here, okay? So the, when equity increases, here are the more equitable education systems. It means that in these education systems, the, child, the child's home background doesn't really have so strong influence in how they do in the, in the school, okay? And 
this is the excellence or quality here. It means that the, the edu education systems that are here have high results in math and science and reading. Are you all with me with this? Because now take a look. This is going to be interesting. This is where the, the average is. Okay? This is the international average equity here. Okay? And average quality over here. And now my question to you is that where is the United States of America? Don't laugh. It's a serious question. Are you sure? Now, let me tell you one thing first. That is a, somehow it's unfair to, you, to look at the United States as an education system because there's no such thing as American education system. You have 50 different systems and 15,000 different subsystems, okay? And if, you take, if we take the 50 different systems, Illinois being one of them, and all the other states, they would be all over the place here, okay? Or we take Chicago as one of these 15,000 systems, they are all over the place, okay? But I'm going to show you where the United States is, and it's here. And it's a surprisingly good situation. It's not so bad as many of you say that lower left here, right? Okay? So you are, in terms of the excellence or quality, you're you are fairly close to the international average, okay? But the public system here, you have 90% of your children are going to public schools here in this country. This is remarkably good performance in equity, okay? So you are, very, you are this much from the international average, okay? And you are so diverse and so much poverty, 23% of your children come from poor homes, okay? A most unequal nation in the world. So this is a, a wonderful achievement, accomplishment from the teachers and, and people who work in the public schools here in America, okay? This is where England is. This is Sweden, Australia, New Zealand, and most of the OECD countries. And what you see here is something that we didn't know 10 years ago. This is something that we, we have only now realized when the um, data has been collected globally. And what is a significant finding here to me is that somehow it seems like these countries are combining equity and excellence, right? There's no, no countries here with the high equity and low quality or high quality and low equity. In other words, it seems like equity and quality and excellence are working hand in hand. If it's so, this will be a significant lesson for the United States as well. If you want to have a uh, high, higher performing system here, you, you have to think equity more carefully, okay? These are the countries, South Korea, Canada, and Japan here, and this place is called heaven. <laughs> it's called heaven because everybody wants to be there, okay? And if you look at these countries here, they are like, it's almost like standing, uh, sitting on the stairway. You remember this Led Zeppelin song? Yeah. Stairway to heaven? <laughs> That's where we are, okay? So now I ask you, where is Finland? Do you know how Finnish flag looks like? I, I'll give you a hint. It's the most beautiful flag in the world. <laughs> okay, I show you where Finland is. This is where Finland was 40 years ago. We had a huge issue with equity because of the parallel system that was run by private schools and then public schools and many other things over there. Read more from my book if you want to. And we had also issue with quality. We were not performing uh, as well as the other countries uh, in math and science and reading, okay? Now, if you look at this, this map here, this flag here, I'll show you what has happened in 40 years. Straight to heaven. <laughs> Took 40 years. Now, or 30 years actually, before we realized. But what, what, what's interesting here is that we, Finland didn't go this way, or we didn't go this way, but we went this way, which means that the first 20 years, 70s and 80s, were heavily investing, building the system that is good for all the children in, in, in the country. In other words, we were investing most of our resources in equity and equality, okay? Making sure about the school funding, special education, early childhood program, we have a universal daycare system for all the children for, um, in, in all the municipalities. Health system and dental care and counselors and all these things are in Finnish schools every day for every child. Every child ha has access to health care in, uh, in school every day. Okay? So that's why 
That's why we have a strong uh, equity over there. Let me go quickly the couple of other things. I often argue that in Finland, both teachers and children have more time to learn than many other countries because we are doing some of these things less than you are, for example. Okay? Here, what you can see here is the junior high school teachers' annual teaching load, and you will see that the Finland is here and the United States is here. You have about 1,080, almost 1,100 hours uh, instruction hours on average for your middle school uh, teachers. I'll take these things away so you will see that this means that about two hours every day Finnish teachers have time to do something else than be in a classroom or teach your uh, students. And this is a time for teachers to learn, teachers to do things together and plan the curriculum and school improvement things and many other things. It's a very, very important thing. It's very difficult to fix the school system if your teachers are teaching all the time. They have to have time, just like medical doctors and lawyers, any other professionals, to spend time with their colleagues and learn and plan and improve their, their own uh, things. This is about the children. You will see that Finland, in Finland, children have, we're looking at the ages 7 to 14, so this is kind of a, a sum, a, a cumulative uh, amount of uh, instruction hours in eight years. So you will see here that Finland has the least number of compulsory instruction hours of all the countries in the world uh, for the children, okay? And the United States is somewhere here, so you have, again, American children when they are 15 has, have spent two years more in formal classrooms, okay? And here you go to school when you are six, right? Six years old? Five. In Finland we go to school when their children are seven. Okay, so you get another two years. Four years in favor of American boys and girls when they are 15, okay? So you can say that in Finland we are doing less of many of these things that in most other parts of the world uh, they are doing, uh, these things are done more. We often argue that this is also, these two years is time for children to learn things, okay? And we have less homework, we have homework but much less than in most parts of the world, no time for test preparation because we don't have any standardized tests to worry about and we don't have any after school tuition. No Finnish child goes to additional um, lessons in the evening to, to do better in the, in the test. So it's a, it's a very different type of system, much more kind of a soft and humane in a way, if you wish. Okay, and the third one and the last thing here is about my niece. This is my sister's daughter. Uh, and I often tell this story because she's a very typical example of what happens, what only happens in Finland. You know, when she was uh, leaving the high school, graduating from high school, she was one of those students that you would call here a straight A student. You know what I mean? The, all the highest marks in all the subjects. And in Finland, you have to study about 15 different subjects, including philosophy, psychology, uh, physics, chemistry foreign languages and many others before you can graduate from high school. And then you see this one and only external standardized examination that we have and she was doing very well, okay? And she decided to become a primary school teacher. To become a primary school teacher in Finland requires that you enroll in one of the research universities in Finland and you do your master's degree. No less than master's degree will take you to a primary school classroom as a teacher. And she wanted to do this, and she, she could have done uh, equally well to go to law school or medicine or business, anything she liked, but she decided to become a primary school teacher. And what happened in, in her first year, uh, first try, was that she was not accepted. And why? Because she, was, she could not explain to the panel in the university in the entrance examination why she wants to teach rather than practice law or medicine or something else. It's a smart question, isn't it? Why do you want to teach? How do you know that you want to spend your life in a difficult and demanding job like being a teacher? And she said, her answer was that, I want to become a teacher because my uncle is a teacher. <laughs> and my mother and grandfather and many people in my family are teachers, so it's like a family business, you know? But that was not enough. So she was rejected, she applied again, she spent a year in a, in a primary school as a as teaching assistant and she learned more about what it is to be a teacher, how teachers think in a school. And when they ask her the same question again next spring, 
she was able to explain and speak about this and she was accepted and now she graduated last year. And she will be one of those teachers, those young people in Finland who will teach all her life. She will not leave uh, before the end of the fifth year like most teachers here in the United States. And that's a, that's a kind of a one advantage that Finland has, okay? So if you think that she was, the, my niece was the kind of an exception, we had last year, or this year actually, 8,500 applicants to these eight universities where we accepted 750. So less than 10% of the applicants were accepted to become primary school teachers. So this is where the competition is tough. In many other countries, Sweden, Norway included, and many parts of the United States, anybody who wants to teach can go there, right? Anybody who wants to become a teacher, you are welcome, and we will train you uh, to be teachers. We don't have Teach for Finland in, in <laughs> Finland like you have Teach for America. <laughs> it's a very different thing. A teach for Finland requires at least five years of academic uh, research-based uh, study. So it's a, we are talking about a very different system, a uh, very different uh, situation in this way. Let me try to, and this is my last thing here, let me try to explain to you a little bit. Where is the, where is the difference here? Because when I'm traveling and speaking around the United States that I've been doing now during the la last three years, I've been everywhere here in your beautiful country, from Alaska to, uh, I'm going to be in Hawaii next week, and Florida, you name it, and I, I, I met educators everywhere. And I often hear this thing, people are saying that um, the problem in the United States is a, is a teacher issue, teacher quality issue, that if only we had teachers like you have in Finland, this would be, everything would be fine. Do you think so? That if you had, if I give you all my teachers in Finland, primary school teachers, and send them here, that they would fix the thing? I don't think so either, okay? But there are many people who think that it, if only we get the smarter and prior people into teaching, that they will somehow fix the thing. And I belong to those who don't believe at all this idea of recruiting some people who are pride from Yale or Stanford to work in your public schools for two or three years and then walk away and do the thing. I, uh, this is not going to uh, work. So those people who think that it's about teachers often think about teacher quality as a human capital. Okay? They think about this whole thing of fixing this human capital by bringing brighter and better young people into schools or giving them a little bit more training and training them, uh, training them better. But there's another dimension, equally important than this human capital thing. Human capital is something that people know and they are able to do, so it's something that I, I have as a teacher in my school, my knowledge and skills in my profession. But there's another dimension, equally important, that is called social capital. This means that how much teachers and people in general can draw value added from their networks, their connections to other people, other teachers, uh, their communities, their associations, and uh, uh, other places. So those people who are more connected to other professionals normally can do better, okay? This is a normal thing in, uh, in life. And then there's still a third dimension. And now this is getting interesting because we are talking about very different type of um, situation in the school. And this is what I call decision, decisional capital. This means, this refers to the fact that if, when people can be part of the decision making regarding their own work or life, they normally do things better, okay? So when the teachers can have a say or when they are part of the setting the standards, evaluating, assessing their students, deciding what type of professional development or school improvement things they need to do, or how they engage with the community, that they can decide these things, they have more decisional capital over there, okay? So this is where Finland is. So we have fairly well-trained teachers. They're not probably uh, the best trained teachers in the world, but we have a very high level of human capital among our teachers because of this academic master's degree that is a minimum degree of all. We have a lot of social capital now because the, we try to avoid competition and you know, build this collaboration, networking, sharing type of culture within our school system. And we have a lot of autonomy. We don't have external standards like you have. All the standards and curriculum is designed and set within the each and every school. So teachers are very free with their colleagues and their principal, their headmaster to uh, decide and plan their curriculum. So that's why this is what, uh, what Hakris and Fulan call professional capital here. And th this is much more than the teacher quality. You see that? That if, the, if we want to have more professional capital, that is a, a kind of a 
deciding fact factor in how good our schools are or how bad our schools are, then we need to pay more attention to social capital and decisional capital. In other words, collaboration, networking of schools and teachers and principals and increasing autonomy and freedom and respect and trust in our teachers, right? And by doing this, we can have more professional capital and this is more important than the human capital in the system, okay? And this is my, my greetings from Finland to you. Three Finnish lessons, there may be more, but these are, I think are relevant for, uh, for this one. The first one goes back to this equity and quality issue. I think equity is excellence or equity is um, quality in, in this sense. We have to rethink and think again what equity in education systems and, uh, and educational reform uh, means. So I'll show you this picture earlier and you will see that all those high, highest performing uh, school systems, uh, South Korea, Canada, Japan and Finland, they are the ones where excellence and equity are combined. They go together, okay? Next one is the school is a team. This means that we should think about school and work of teachers more as a team sport rather than an individual marathon that each and every teacher is required to do and see that who gets the finish line first, okay? And that's why I, I belong to those who think that the quality of education system uh, uh, can exceed the quality of its teachers, unlike those who often say that the quality can, cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. And that's, I think this is a fundamentally different way of thinking about this. This requires that we have to think about teachers and schools as a team, football team or basketball team that can do wonderful things. There are many examples, by the way, of teams in team sports where the team that has not the five-star superstar players can exceed and beat those who have much better individuals there. If they have a leadership and good coach and spirit and mission to do, do these things, just like Chicago Blackhawks last year. <laughs> or Finland in ice hockey world championships and Olympics next spring <laughs> in Sochi. Okay, and then the third one is the, that children must play. This breaks my heart. It breaks my heart every time when I see the, um, uh, the policies and, and ideas that are insisting children to start schooling earlier. And there are some systems here in the United States where children are sitting the first standardized test at the age of three. Yeah? And school, the, school, the formal schooling begins at the age of three. I think that's the wrong thing to do. And look at this one. This is the ADHD. Everybody knows what the ADHD is. It's the attention. Um, Deficit hyperactivity disorder. Yeah. So it's about the kids who are, you know, they cannot sit down and, you know, focus on what the teachers are saying. They are about ten, almost 10 percent of the three to 17 year old kids here in the United States are diagnosed as ADHD. Huge number. In Finland, it's less than one one percent. Our experts say that they are more than that, but we have under one percent of. Uh, the children are in medication. Here in the United States, about 10% of those kids are using drugs. That are, they are narcotic, uh, narcotic uh, drugs. You know, the interesting thing here in the map for me is that the closer you get to the United States, more ADHD you seem to have. When you go to the closer to the D Washington DC, right? Where the politics <laughs> is. <laughs> we are all there, okay? Now, this is my story. but. I, I told you that I have two sons. This is my, our younger son, Otto. And Otto is now 18 months old. And he asked me to tell you that children must play. <laughs> okay? But, but more than this, you know, when I was leaving for this trip and I left my wife and, and Otto home, I had my suitcase and things in my hands and I went to look at my son and, you know, he was looking at me exactly like this with his big blue eyes. And before I could say anything to greet him goodbye, he looked at me and said, that, Daddy, why do you need to go? Stay here with mother and me because we need you much more than these people in Chicago. <laughs> and you know, in Finland, children can speak fluently about these things when they are <laughs> one and a half. But this is my question to you, that what would you say? 
And I know that there are people in the audience who are sometimes in the same situation that you go and say that I have to do something very important. And it's a good excuse. So what did I say? I said that, you know, Otto, when you were born in a, on April 17, 2012, there were 350,000 children. Your sisters and brothers who were born on that very same day with you around the world. Many of them are in developing countries. The following day, another 350,000, and next day, 350,000 children more. They're all your brothers and sisters somewhere there. And I'm afraid that if I don't go to Chicago and talk to these people and ask them to think about equity and the children must play and many of these other things, that these children do not have the school, a public school or a place where they can learn these wonderful ideas of democracy that you can see written here on the wall, inspired by the great John Dewey that was living and working here in, in Chicago. And before I can say anything else, he tells me that, okay, good. You can go, but please come back safe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we have a little moment for questions. If you have questions or comments or reactions to this, I'm very happy to take. Some, but please keep your questions short and brief, and I'll keep my answers brief as well. Yeah, okay. Um, two questions. What oh, was the see, catalyst? No, just one, please. Okay, what was the catalyst that caused the change to occur 30 years ago? And the other half of that question, which is still the same question, what, how did you overcome the institutional inertia that always resists change? Yeah, well, you know, the, the um, Kind of a starting point for all these that we decided to do 40 years ago, that we, we chose the way of equity and building a good school for everybody was simply because Finland is small. We don't have gas and oil and any wealth in our soil. Actually, our, our soil is frozen more than six months a year. Okay? So if we want to be like Sweden and Norway and the, the rest of the Western world, um, this is how we thought in 1970s or 60s actually. This was in the middle of the Cold War, that we, we have to cultivate our people, our minds. That's the only thing we have. And we are so few that we cannot think like you can, you can hear in the United States or people in France or Germany, that it's enough to educate some people, to get the kind of a elite that will take care of the politics and business and all these other things. We need to educate every single child, okay? And it's a very, it, it's a, it was an economic imperative, but it was also a kind of a... Um, humanistic and social um, uh, reason there. That we need to have a better educated nation if we want to be like the others. And Finland was that time in the 1960s and 70s, we were still living under the kind of a shadow of the Soviet Union, okay? And it's a, it's a very different time that it is now, and it was easy to convince all these different political parties in our country that we had to work for this together. And it's a little bit same as you, are, you guys are in a little bit same situation here in the United States. That unless you are able to bring you know, these parties and powers together and say that we have to do something differently together, the same race is going to continue over and over again. Okay? And things are not going to get any better. It seems, sometimes it seems to me like here, unfortunately, and many other places, you are trying to do, do a wrong thing a little bit Rider. <laughs> Trying to do the wrong thing a little bit rider. Okay? Yes, yeah, so, so um, you mentioned diversity a little bit. Uh, I'd like to explore that uh, as an uh, actual parameter uh, in your uh, discussion. Namely, uh, the stereotype I have of Finland is that it's a relatively uh, uniform population and relatively straightforward probably not too straightforward, but relatively straightforward to come to a consensus about some issue. Now, of course, in the United States, when I mentioned diversity, I mean, you can see in the way our government functions or doesn't function, uh, there's enormous, enormous diversity, especially when it comes to finding uh, a common uh, ground for making decisions 
and, and taking a particular uh, p position. Right. So I'm just asking, asking if, if that's a legitimate parameter one should think about. Thank you. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, as I said, we are very different to the United States. But I think most people, even in this hall, that you have probably a little bit wrong idea of the, um, the, the Finland being a very homogeneous country right now. First of all, we have, we have three official languages, okay? And everybody, every, everyone in Finland has to be, uh, has to master two of those, okay? The, the major languages are Finnish and Swedish language, okay? That's, so we have this type of diversity. And now we have a lot of, a very fast um, uh, influx of immigrants. It's still fairly at the low level, but it's one of the most, the fastest growing diversity in, within the whole Europe now because of many, many reasons. Finland is part of the European Union, and that's why we have to, all the doors are open, the borders are open in, in this way. So Finland today, if you have been in Finland uh, 20 years ago, what you see today in Helsinki and many other parts of the world is completely changed, okay? So we have, for example, in Helsinki, you can, I can easily take you to schools where a uh, vast majority of pupils are coming from immigrant background families, from the homes where they don't speak Finnish at all. But it's still, comp comparing to the United States, we are still, of course, very, we are much smaller and we are also more homogeneous. But I, I hope that you do not use this lack of diversity as an argument of saying that Finland is irrelevant because it's different. Of course, we are different, but we are different in many other ways than just these things. But there are many things that you can learn, um, and everybody can learn from Finland. And I'm not standing here before you to try to convince you that you have to do, if you do here in Chicago, in the United States, the things that we, Finland has done, everything will be fine. It doesn't work like this. But I'm trying to convince you that, please, if you are interested in this thing, use Finland as an inspiration, as a good source of kind of a good questions for yourself. Are we really doing the right things? Are we putting the priorities in the right places here in the United States when we try to fix and improve uh, the lives of our children? Okay? And that's, we are not able to provide solutions to this, but we are able to inspire people to think and look at your own things in another way. Okay? Um, I'm assuming when you begin grading in the fifth grade that students do differentiate themselves. Some are better at math than others. How does that fact coexist with equity? Uh, very good question. You, you know, we have a, the, the whole student assessment culture is, in Finland is very different. Not only that we are not relying on census-based standardized testing as you do. Census-based meaning that you are testing all the children regularly every year that we are testing some of the children sometimes using samples. But the other difference is that the whole assessment um, uh, logic is different because here in the United States, when you give a grade to a student, you give a grade based on how close or how far the student is from the, the grade average, okay? The American teachers often in Finland ask the, our teachers that how many of your kids read at the grade level? And Finnish teachers don't know what it means. <laughs> because in Finland, the assessment is based on giving a grade to a student based on his or her own potential. Okay? So it's not a kind of an objective assessment. In other words, you cannot compare the grades of one student to another because they mean different things. Do you see what I mean? And that's why... It's, it's, you know, your, your question of how do we deal with this, of course there are, there are differences when the students study, particularly math and sciences, that there are those who do it very well and those who don't, okay? But we still have a very different scale for this because we are not comparing, we are not using these percentages or uh, normal distributions in, in giving these grades. It's all based on kind of a subject, subjective um, assessment of the teacher. And that's why we need master's degree based teachers because they have to understand, they have to be able to read and understand each and every child in the classroom. How good they could be if they were doing uh, what they can do there. So that's why it's a different, um, it's a little bit different thing. So we are keeping this system as it is like now all the way until the end of the high school when the kids are 18 or 19 and then they, they everybody will go through the same standardized examination 
And that's the only point where we can really compare how good or how bad the kids are compared to one another. But before that, we are not do doing that at all. Can we still take one, or what is the timing? 20. I'll, I'll take one more question. If there's, is there a microphone somewhere there? Yeah, there, there was a yeah, there was a question of a class. You know, norm, normal a typical class size in primary school is about 20 kids, 22. In a high school, you can see sometimes much larger classes than that. Um, but I often say that it's just 20 or 22 children in a, in a typical classroom. A lot of arts. Now, this is the last one. Arts and music. Arts and music are the backbone of Finnish school system. So, for example, in many, many of our schools, there's, a, there's a one item in a, in a music education standard or curriculum. That it says that before you leave the school, you have to learn to play an instrument. You can choose your instrument yourself, but you have to learn to play one instrument. And what I didn't say, that before you can get into the primary school teacher education program in the university, you have to be able to sing. <laughs> I tried it once. And they asked me to sing a song, and I said, what do you want to hear? And I said, any song you like. And I sang, and they said, thank you, that's enough, and I never got there. <laughs> but seriously, if you cannot sing, you can never be a teacher in Finland. Thank you very much.